Okay. Um, let me shut this. This because of the TV. Oh, go turn. Hey, Jan. It should be okay with the door. Just go close that door in the bedroom. Just go over there and just close that door. I mean, you can't hear it. Yeah, that'll do it. Which? Yeah, straight ahead. Just close that door. Still a little loud though, isn't it? I'll just set this one. Is that all right? Yeah. Set, yeah. That'll that'll cut it out enough. Good. It won't pick up on the on what we're doing now. <clears throat> no. <Moved. laughs> it's all right. No, I just readjust here. <laughs> okay, Ed. So, first to talk about the Sunny and Cher State Fair 1965 show, how it came about, how it went, whatever you want to say about it. In the in early that year, in about June, I got a call from uh, William Moore saying that they had this new act called Sunny and Cher and they wanted me to use them this summer. And, and so I said, okay. So I flew down. And they were living in a garage, uh, in back of a garage, and they were they hadn't even had any records out then that early, and I and so I went and I met them and and they were dressed in their what they were wearing in those days and and then met them so I said uh, yeah I'll put them at the Oregon State Fair because they're different and and so I put them on as an opening act they were not the main act well, of course by that time uh, I got them here. Uh, I got you, babe. Was uh, number one, and there were uh, the, in the top ten. I think there were three or four of their records were in the top ten by the time they got here. So they were huge. So the act that was going to be there uh, decided not to come. They just said, "Hey, they're the stars, not us." And so I got him here, and uh, they flew into Portland and went up and picked him up, drove him to Salem, and they did a rehearsal. And uh, I can't remember, I think it was July 5 that was their backup band. And, and uh, we did a rehearsal and got them to their uh, hotel room downtown and, and um, picked them up and brought them out there for the show. And uh, it was huge. I mean, there was a lot of people there because by, by that time they were a pretty big deal. In fact, they flew out of here the next day to for New York. They were on Hallibaloo, which was a big show. And so I hit it on the head. That was a good one. Uh, I picked one that really did very well, and uh, Fair did well, and uh, they were they were happy, and uh, and it was with the Teen Fair that Myron Frank put on, which was very well done. They put together quite a Teen Fair. For example, they built a, a girl's bedroom, and uh, with beds and all the new stuff that girls would have in their bedrooms, and we had displays of teen things that Myron Frank did, which was very very well done. But it was quite a day. Uh, Sonny was a promoter. Uh, he he wore all his money and a and and a money belt around his ankle, and, I, and he'd be out on stage and he'd wave his foot over the crowd. And I went, holy cow! He had he, he wanted to be paid in cash, which most acts wanted because they're on the road and and a lot of people won't take checks from uh, musical groups on the road, and so he wanted cash. So he had a ton of cash on him. I always thought they could drag him into the crowd and, and he could have been robbed, but he wasn't. Uh, Cher is very young. I, I, I don't know how old she was, but I think she was around 16 to 19. Very, very young. And he met her in Chicago because Sonny was uh, uh, a partner with Phil Spector. And uh, Cher was one of the Ronettes. And that's how Sonny met her. She was in the Ronettes. And they were recording the Ronettes. Phil Spector was. And then Sonny was there. And he met her in, he met her in Chicago. And uh, they uh, they ended up uh, moving to L.A. and and starting to sing and became huge. Uh, they didn't really want to do the Salem thing because they had all the New York stuff coming at them and they didn't have time to do it. So we really jammed them when they got here and we got them out of town. They were always very cordial, very nice. That was when I got pulled over by a cop for speeding, and uh, he walked up to the car and said, "You're speeding." I said, "No, I'm late to." get these people to their hotel room, and he says, well, who's in there? I said, Sonny and Sharon. He says, can I have their autograph? And he got their autograph, and he left. 
that was kind of a funny story because even Sonny was laughing about that one going, anywhere else that would give me a ticket. I said, well, here in Oregon, you're a star. And uh, it, was a, it was an interesting day hanging out with him. Okay, that's good, that's good. Yeah, you gave me a little bit of information last time on that, but a little more thorough this time. So that's good. I have a lot of pictures of them to use, so I wanted you to go a little longer, so that's good. Okay. So, okay, so now Dino, Dizzy, and Billy, there's quite a few images of them to use too, so I wanted to go a little longer on them, but um, do you want to talk about, they did a show in Portland, Salem and Portland. You, yeah. Back-to-back uh, back with them. Yeah, I had, uh, yeah, I had a Portland show on Friday night, so I stuck them in that, and then I brought them to Saturday, okay. brought them that maybe, Saturday into Salem. Mention, mention Dino, Desi, and Billy. You know, I, I didn't know whether they were a big deal or their folks were bigger deals. I, I never could figure that out. I know that when I picked them up at the airport, we were driving into Portland to get them their rooms, and Kiss and played their new hit. And Dino goes, I didn't sing that. And the other one says, we, we, that's not our record. So I drove directly over to Kiss, and I said, where'd you get that? And they said, it just came in the mail. It's their latest release. They had to go in the back room, listen to the record, learn the words, so they could play it that night at the Coliseum, because they hadn't heard the record. I said, well, you sang it, didn't you? They said, you know, we probably did. They'd run us to the studio and we'd do 20, 30 songs. And they were picking it out and releasing. And their road manager was a guy by the name of Howard. He was a Marine drill sergeant that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, one of the parents knew. I think it was uh, Desi. Uh, it was a friend of her mom who was a Marine drill. They hired to go on the road. And I got to tell you, those kids towed the line. And they... They never misbehaved. They never did anything wrong. They were always gentlemen. Dino and Desi, they all were gentlemen. Now, Dino was Dean Martin's son. Desi was Desi Arnez's son. And, uh, and the other one was their, their son of their stockbroker. And uh, he uh, was a gentleman also. But he, uh, when Dino, Desi, and Billy ended, uh, he went to work for the Beach Boys as a piano player because the piano player quit. And the piano player's name was Glenn Campbell. He quit, so this guy stepped in for his spot. And I saw him over out. We used to talk about that all the time. I said, what was it like being with Dino, Desi, and Billy? He says, they were just a bunch of prima donnas. And, and this kid was pretty square and straight away. He was a stockbroker's kid. But it was, that was an interesting relationship because we were sitting backstage and, and uh, Howard got a phone call from somebody saying, buy Learjet. So he looked at me and said, buy Learjet. I said, so I called Janet. We bought Learjet. It went straight up. It went crazy. I think I made more money off that stock than I did that whole tour. That's good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, see how we're doing here. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about the, now, Johnny Cash, it was 1966. Was that the first time you had him? <laughs> No, uh, he came in here, uh, and a guy by the name of Namark was a promoter out of Chicago, called me up and he said, I've got this package of the Everly Brothers and Johnny Cash put together. Oh, and by the way, there's this guy on it by the name of uh, Tex Ritter. I said, not the Tex Ritter that just got out of jail. He went, we don't talk about that. He's Johnny's friend, but Tex Ritter will be on the show and also... There were other names, other people on the show too. And you're gonna film that poster here pretty soon and mm -hmm. you'll know everybody was on it. And so I, I, he said, I wanna play him at the armory. I said, well, great, I, I'll do all the pre-work out in front, but I know he had a ton of money in it and he was on his way to Seattle and he wanted to play somewhere, so he played here. We still did pretty good. I think he did pretty good. I think Len did okay. But it was the first time Johnny Cash ever played here, but I brought him into the fair quite a few times after that in the late 60s, 60s. But uh, Johnny Cash was one of my favorite. I, I played his stuff in high school. I was the only kid that played Johnny Cash in high school. And I've still got a lot of his records, but for some reason we just kind of bonded. People used to say, you know, he was a drunk. He was, never saw that, never saw him take a drink, never saw him misbehave. Uh, he treated June like a million bucks. And that movie, um, that movie made me puke. It was so far off base of what I knew. 
If he was like that, I didn't know that because he was always a gentleman around me, and and with his wife and Johnny Jr. was uh, was they were they were the, he made his band and everybody told the line, but he's the one that we had that interview with KGW and and uh, he, he, he Len called me up and guy he goes uh, make sure he was his road manager said he talk doesn't talk about Folsom Prison. He played at Folsom Prison. He was never there as a convict. But they built it in to make it sound like he went to Folsom Prison. And so I won't tell you the name of the guy at KGW because he's a jerk. And the second question out of his mouth in the interview on the stage at the State Fair was, well, how long were you in Folsom Prison? And Johnny Cash turned and looked at me, glared at me. And Len goes, he'll bring it up. I said, well, I told him not to, but the guy's a jerk. So we're in the car, taking him back to the hotel. He gave Johnny one of his T-shirts, his face on it, saying KGW on it. And he had it in his hand. And he was sitting in the front seat. We are on Market Street going to the hotel. And all of a sudden, Johnny's window went down. And Len and I are sitting in the back seat going, uh, Lou Robbins is his name. Lou goes, oh, oh. Now, window goes down, and Johnny has that T-shirt in his hand. The window goes down, and the T-shirt went out the window, and the window went back up. He never brought it up again. But, but he said, I'll tell him that you told him not to say anything. He says, but he seems to like it. He gave me a lot of stuff. He gave me belt buckles and pictures, and, and uh, we seemed to click. And, and I'm sure it was because I was hiring him and paying him pretty good money. But he just seemed like a nice guy. And everybody says, oh, he was, I saw that movie made me puke because I didn't see that side of him. I never saw that side of him. But I guess tickets to movies don't sell if you're a nice guy. you got to be a bad guy. So I guess that's why they did that. I don't know because I never saw that side of Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that too. The one with, let's see, the one came out, what, four, five, six years ago? Yeah, it was called what, Puke. It was called, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, 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 I never met the guy, so I didn't know. Yeah, good guy. You know, yeah. And we'll have you talk more about him later, too, um, when we do our... Am I, am I getting paid session. by the hour? Well, I, I better <laughs> cut this short, because I think you are. You don't have that much okay. money. Yeah. How about, okay, Paul Revere and the Raiders, um, they came here a lot. But like, big act, what, big what, act. What they were like to have here and how the crowds how the crowds liked them and what Paul was really like what the band was like and how you got to know them and all just kind of off the top of your head what? well they played a car show and I went to the car show and the kids wanted to dance they couldn't because there were cars in there I saw that one hey they belong in a dance so I, I met Paul Paul was lived in Portland he was a conscientious objector so he wouldn't go in the service so he did his time in Portland at a hospital as a conscientious objector and didn't go in the service. So I kind of got to know him. Mark Lindsay was a gardener in Lake Oswego High School. And, and all those guys had jobs in Portland. They, they, they met and kind of got together in Boise, but they all ended up in Portland and that's how they kind of got together. They've got the band together. And that's, I got to know him and Paul was just another good guy. Paul was a hardworking, good guy. He found Mark, Mark was the lead singer. And, uh, but yeah, he, uh, I never will forget that when we first started playing in small halls, he had no money. He was high, driving around that old hearse all the time because he could store all the stuff in the back and get the five guys in the hearse and he'd drive everywhere. And so we'd always, after the shows, have him come to the house when we lived in Kaiser. And they'd come in there and Jan would always have food for him, you know, because they didn't want to spend. I think Paul had money. He was just cheap. But, but you know, you got to respect that because he, he, he was trying to make it. But I remember that one time she said, uh, there's uh, five of them and we're, there's 10 more coming, so there's 15. She says, how many hot dogs should I get? And I says, well, I guess she was on a budget too. So I said, well, get 50. They ate all those hot dogs before the other people even got there. We had to go more and get more hot dogs. They ate, they were hungry. I uh, got to know the band good. They come to the house uh, uh, when Paul made it. We were still friends. In fact, here a few years ago, he called me up and I went down to Florida and got on a cruise ship with him he was playing on. 
and we cruise around. And we we got to spend a couple of weeks together and just talking about the old days. And you know, when I started, I didn't have anything, and he didn't have anything. And, and he he's doing very well. And then he and Mark broke up. I got a kick out of Paul. We talk maybe once a month, or so we talk quite a bit. I got a kick out of him. He, he uh, called up one time and he goes, uh, "You coming to Florida?" I went, "Why would I go to Florida?" He said, "Well, I I'm playing on this cruise ship. You want to come?" And, and his wife was there, and she was she played Marilyn Monroe on the Legend Show in in Las Vegas. And I said, "Well, sure. Well, we, so we we flew down there, stayed at this hotel." And I said, "Well, there's a hot, there's a hamburger joint across the street." And he says, "Well, you can't really go over there." I'll have to get some, a police escort for you. And I said, why? He said, well, this isn't the best part of town. And so we got to go over to the hamburger joint. I had four cops around me. And Jan, we walked over to the hamburger joint, got a sack of burgers, brought it back, and we had burgers in Paul's room that night. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed him and, and his wife. They were good people. They were very good people. And 90% of the people I worked with were nice to me because I hired them and was paying them good money. But I think we got to be pretty good friendships because that kind of fell through. I mean, kind of followed through after I sold the company and kind of got out of it. You could always tell who the real loyal friends were and who the friends weren't that weren't loyal or whatever. But hey, I got 800 Christmas cards the last year I was in business, and when I sold my prison, when I sold my business, I got 30 the next year. Does that tell you anything? They loved me. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, they really love me. That's good. <clears throat> okay. Anything else about Raiders at all? Nothing other than it was okay. a great experience, and I still talk to Paul. Yeah. And he's been a friend for years, and, I, and we will continue to be friends. Okay. And I think he owes me some money. I think he does. I'm not sure. I can't find the note. Paul probably stole it. I got a picture he signed. Ed, where's my money? And I kept that picture. I, I put on there, I can't remember that. How much do I owe you? Goodbye, I hope I never see you again. I sent it back to him. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard from him since? No, I tried to get a hold of him because you want to interview him, and, yeah. and he hasn't called me back. So. Yeah, must be doing something. <laughs> I think he's got a health problem, and uh -huh. it's none of your business or mine. So, yeah. But he's I, old. He's the same age as I am, so he's old. What? <laughs> he's, they're playing, though. I, I looked at their schedule. Yeah. They're out and about a little bit down at so, feathers and uh yeah. grand's path i go down and see him but he'd charge me so i told him i couldn't <laughs> afford it free. i can't afford it <laughs> how about the how about the dick clark show that you did in 65 with zombies shangri-la velvet del shannon right elsewhere on it too. so talk about that's a call a busload of dick clark stars and one of the groups on that had the number one record, but I didn't select him because I bought it out in front. And I didn't know he was going to be. So he he started selling programs at the show. I can't remember who it was, but he, it was it was a joke of the day. Was that here's the guy who's got the number one record in the United States selling programs out front. And I went to him. And I said, Is, "How does this make you feel?" He says, "Ed, I make more money selling programs than getting paid by Dick Clark." And I said, "Well, that's a good deal." So I think it was Del Shannon. No, it was not Del Shannon. It was uh, who had birds and the bees? That was I never forget that song. But whoever had birds and the bees, he was there selling programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned the last time you did. I forget the name. You mentioned it. I'll have to review the last tape. Let's see, yeah. Um, but anyway, that was, that was a Dick Clark. Yeah, I thought I thought he was going to be there to MC it, but he, he was not. But that same show played Portland the next night. And I did a bigger crowd in Salem than he did in Portland. Because kids here in town wanted to go to shows. And they did. And dance. Yeah. Everly, Everly Brothers, well, you talked about them a little bit before. Um, I don't know, anything. They were just a classic act that had lots of hits and we were Procolor brothers that uh, were fun to work with. And the last time I had them at the Oregon State Fair, there was a little riff going on, but I don't know what it was. I never forget they were back there. One was on one side of the stage, and one was on the other side of the stage. And Goldschmidt came in, he wanted to see the show. And he went over and talked to one of them, and 
and uh, kind of left. And the other brother came to me and said, who was that? And I said, well, that was our governor, Goldstein. He said, well, why didn't he come over and talk to me? I guess I said to him, I guess he just didn't know who you were. And he laughed. He goes, what the heck? But uh, they were a, a riff. I've heard since then, they're, they've pretty well made up, are good friends again. Probably one of them went broke and lend the other money, so they're friends now. Who knows? I, I don't know. But I always enjoyed them. They were good. Okay. I want to talk more about the Rolling Stones show, 65, with the Live Five opening up. Um, you mentioned, what was it, Mick Jagger wanted, asked you to be the tour promoter? He, <clears throat> he had never played the Northwest before. So when he showed up, he was just like a regular guy. He was hanging out and talking. And uh, the, the guy who's kind of ramrod in the show came to me and said, keep everybody away from him. He's just, just you know, he's young and, and uh, we're putting him on that side of the Coliseum dressing rooms and kind of just keep everybody away from him. So I turn around and I look back there and I guess who's back there talking to him? Billy O'Brien. And, and, and he came to me and he said, uh, I told you not to let anybody back there. I said, well, he's one of the Life Five. That's Billy O'Brien. And Hewlett was his name. He was kind of a, the road manager for Rolling Stones and John Denver and Elvis, and he, he, was, he was a big deal. And he kind of got upset. He said, what's he doing back there? So he went back and talked to Jagger, and Jagger said, no, it was enjoyable. We were just standing there talking. That's when that picture was taken. But that was O'Brien. O'Brien did what O'Brien wanted to do, and he wanted to talk to Jagger, and he got his picture taken, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't get uptight about things in those days, but, but everybody knew that Jagger was going to be huge. And he hadn't played here. So I was sitting backstage, and he came over and sat down next to me. He said, who are you? And I said, well, I do shows in the Northwest. Da -da -da -da. I work with KJR in Seattle, and we're kind of partners on stuff. And I've run stuff down to Seattle. And I used to do the forum in, or the, uh, the, the theater in around San Francisco, did a lot of that. And I was doing colleges. And he, he said, what about putting together a tour for me? And I went, well, you know, I've got all the dance halls I've got going, plus I've got Myron Frank tickets, plus I'm an owner of a radio station. I've got like seven companies going. And, and, and I had just finished a tour with the Dave Clark Five and the Animals, and it didn't go that great. The, the English acts hadn't caught on really yet. And so I kind of made a comment, I'm a little busy, and you know, I think English acts are great, but I don't think I want to do that. He got kind of mad at me. I can't tell you what he said to me. I think he used some bad language, but I can't remember. And uh, I always laughed about that because when he got huge, I went, the problem with that is you take on one of those guys, they're, they're gorillas, they're big. You gotta get a divorce, you'll have more money than you've ever had, you'll be hanging out with people you don't like, you'll be places you don't wanna be, and you gotta say things you don't want to say, well, I do that anyway. You got to say things you don't want to say. But I just didn't want to do it. And so when I saw him again the next time, we sat and laughed about it. Mm -hmm. Because when Satisfaction came out, he was a giant. Yeah. So. Okay. We, just, we have to be careful with the chair. Oh, okay. Make it too much squeaking noise. But, um, what else? How about... Talking about the uh, how you dealt with the drug problem that kind of arose toward the later 60s. Yeah, the drugs didn't really hit Salem until later on in the 60s. The Coliseum shows in Portland that you could they were you could see that they were starting to get a little. They were they were there, but not till towards the end of the 60s, early 70s. It really got, which I didn't realize how bad it was. Cause we had an overdose at one of my shows in Portland, the Coliseum. The kid literally died in his seat. And I think, I think when I saw that, I kind of phased away from the shows, got into fairs and festivals, because it was getting kind of out of hand. In Salem, we had people in all the restrooms looking for that. And we stopped it, I thought, pretty much. But then the fairs and the festivals got so big, I just backed away from the dances. Yeah, it was good. getting crazy. Good, good. Okay. Um, 
I was talking about anything comes to mind about <clears throat> problems and challenges booking bands in the 60s? Well, later on the 60s, it got to be such a big deal. There were a lot of people coming forward with accusations that I had an exclusive on the Armory and that was illegal. And so we had a few battles over that. And the military's saying on the other side that, you know, nobody was using it. Now Ed's in here using it once a month, twice a month, sometimes three times a month. Look at all the revenue we're coming in. So they put the bid out and they just said, if you're willing to come in here three, four times a month, we'll rebid it. Well, nobody wanted to do that, so they walked away. We had a few other problems with, with uh, the drug things in the bathrooms, but we got rid of that real quick too. Just put people in there and knew what to look for. And, uh, and it, it pretty well come down to, you knew who the drug dealers were anyway. So the minute they come through the front door, you'd put the cops on them or our security guys on them. They would make it so uncomfortable for them, they'd either leave or wouldn't come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you, so you're getting out of the dance shows and more into the fair stuff. I want to talk about that, how you were expanding your business, expanding in, in different areas in the, sev in the sev later 70s? Uh, mid, middle 70s on. Yeah. Talk about that changeover. Well, get... all of a sudden I realized that fairs were playing this big money for no-name acts. And what I introduced to fairs was that you can bring a big-name act. They're not as expensive as you said, think they are. So I started bringing big names to fairs, which they hadn't had. And in fact, the first fair I did, I brought uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis in, which, God, oh, that went great. I brought the uh, Pat Boone family in. I brought... Uh, a lot of big names in. What I realized when I was doing the dances is there's two groups of entertainers. There's groups who play the East Coast and groups who play the West Coast. And I had exposed those West Coast acts to the West Coast, all the way from Seattle to San Diego. And we made stars out of B.J. Thomas, acts like that, that had a lot of hits that the middle of the road people wanted to see. And I just integrated that concept into fairs. In other words, I call up radio stations and says, who you playing? Who's your request list? I'd call the record distributing houses in Seattle and say, who's selling? Who's getting played? And what record labels are spending money on them? And with that formula, it worked. Because I found out if people were buying their album, listening to them on, they knew who they were. So I could take an act that wasn't a big deal nationally and bring them here and we sell tickets because people wanted to see them. Uh, it was kind of interesting to put them at the, at the uh, Oregon State Fair because I helped design this, this uh, amphitheater that's here. I copied the one in Kawagoi. I don't know how many acts got on that stage and would say, thanks, Ed. They'd point over towards the armory and says, I remember when we played that. And say they went from the armory to the fair. That was kind of neat. That transition was kind of neat. And then I owned the local country western radio station. So we play a lot of good countries. So that was my key, which country to bring in. I can remember back in the old days, we used to bring Buck Owens in. He was huge. Buck Owens was huge. And a lot of those country acts we brought in were just huge. Helen Cornelius. Just a lot of them. And we developed that market. And that's how those markets got started. I think today they bring in too many big names and pay them too much money. I don't see how they can make money, but I hope they do. I don't know. That's good. Um, yeah, I like that. You covered that good. But when we meet next time, we'll talk more about the, the fairs. The 80s and 90s, the fair stuff, a lot more in detail. Successful that, fairs are run by successful fair boards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, you know, one of those radio ads, little tapes, you know, that we that we discovered. One of them, it advertises a vanilla fudge show with Led Zeppelin, the band Led Zeppelin too, and that must have been canceled. That show. 
I found, it, I found a thing that's on the internet, Led Zeppelin U.S. Tour. The January 1st, Salem Armory Auditorium, canceled because of New Year's Eve break. Rain? Break. New Year's Eve Oh, I don't know. Break? I don't know what that... I don't either. Me, but do, you have, do you recall that? No. That show being canceled? No. They, Led Zeppelin was so big because of who yeah. was in it. Who, who was in it? Yeah, oh, what's his name, man? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Pause this. Hello. Hey, Bo. Sitting in the office being interviewed. Can I call you back? Uh, oh, okay. Okay, sweetie. I'm hanging up. Talk to you later, buddy. We're sitting here looking at a picture of you. Who is John with in that picture? Don, that picture you developed for me. Oh, oh Dwight Yoakam. Dwight Yoakam. I found a bunch of negatives, and Chuck took them and developed them, and you and Dwight, and we finally figured out what you guys have in common. Nothing. Goodbye. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, Led Zeppelin, yeah, because they, they were, they, they be, they're huge now. I mean, oh, yeah. They're huge. Well, you know, Paige and those they guys. they were opening for Vanilla Fudge at that show. Yeah, okay. Canceled. Yeah. So interesting, there's a, that, that one radio spot. Mentions them on there. Well, I would love to have Led Zeppelin at the Salem Army, but I don't remember that. Yeah. Maybe when I was 63, I might have remembered it. Yeah. I don't remember it now. Let's <laughs> see. We're getting close to the end here. Uh, oh, yeah, you mentioned to me that you you worked with Concert West. You, yes. You kind of collaborated with them. Well, Concerts West brought a lot of th stuff through, and this was a good dumping place, Salem over Portland because we pulled Valley Kids, whereas Portland pulled Portland Kids. And if Portland Kids wanted to see that show, they'd go to Seattle. So, so yeah, we did a lot of Concert West stuff here. Tom Hewlett and I worked closely together. Okay. And you mentioned to me about the, uh, the insurance thing that you shared. Well, we were, all of a sudden we realized we were a business. So where do we cut expenses to make more money? And we were, I said, Tom, are you buying insurance? He goes, yeah. And are you buying insurance? Yeah. But didn't realize that my homeowners also covered me. So I had double insurance and he had double. So one show we would use Concerts West, next show we use EJD. So that's where we cut some of our expenses. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's about all I got, Ed. Actually, anything you think we should say though? While well, we got the camera rolling, uh, seventies era, era, seventies era. Pretty much got into the fairs, give the people what they wanted: country western, the Osmonds, uh, you know that stuff. It was we really turned it family oriented. So we still brought, you know, in ten days we'd still bring some rock and roll in. We brought Paul in, you know, because everybody liked Paul Bear narrators. And, and we brought the Osmonds in because everybody liked the Osmonds. Uh, but most of the stuff we did at Ferris was family oriented. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll stop there. Unless you got anything else. That covers what I needed today. Good. Okay. Good, good, good. Good stuff. Good stuff.